It's been 25 years since the nation of South Africa dismantled apartheid. While there has been political progress since, the young democracy has also faced many setbacks, most recently with failing infrastructure. Rolling blackouts and water use restrictions have become part of daily life. Special correspondent Fred DeSam Lazaro starts his report in Cape Town. It's hard to escape the spectacular views, the iconic Table Mountain, beaches, even penguins that put Cape Town atop so many travel bucket lists. It's also hard to imagine, but last year this city of 3.7 million was brought to its knees by an epic drought, one that dominated news headlines for months. Our dam levels are sitting at 25.5 percent at this stage. Officials placed strict consumption limits and even predicted a so-called day zero when the taps would run completely dry. And day zero is predicted for the 11th of May. In the end, the dreaded day did not arrive thanks to some rainfall and also because consumers overall cut their water use by 60 percent. So the first catch of water, which is cold, that's coming out of the shower goes into a separate bucket. Vanessa Birch showed me how carefully every drop is conserved, beginning in the bathroom. All the shower water that we trap in the, uh, in the shower tray in the bucket there is used for the, to run the toilet. A sophisticated system collects rainwater into basement storage tanks, enough for a 10-month reserve. At the height of the 2017-18 drought period, we were in fact completely independent with water. It's efficient but also expensive to install and well out of reach of most Cape Town residents, especially the 20 percent who live in neighborhoods like Langa, unincorporated settlements that are a legacy of apartheid or official racial separation. There's no running water in homes here. A single communal tap might serve several dozen families. Still, conditions are better than last year when some of these taps would come on for only limited hours. And it's far better here than in many other parts of South Africa. 500 miles away in Makanda, population 70,000, some taps have already run dry. Residents like Noholo Saki wait in line for hours for a two-day supply of drinking water. So what have you been doing to cope? Toilets are dirty, tabs are empty, it's terrible. Just how terrible? Across South Africa, that largely depends on where you live. In any city, you'll find a well-manicured, mostly white section with first world living standards. Across the way, what was officially a colored settlement and growing out of it an informal settlement called Sun City in this case, where living standards are as miserable as you'll find in any poor country. Here amid tin shack-like homes, two water taps serve about 300 residents. Water was running the day we visited, and Selena Pikes seized the opportunity to wash her family's clothes. Some days maybe they can't be not water a week. For a week, no For water. For a week, no water. To get a sense of the magnitude of the water crisis in Makanda, we visited the Settler's Dam. There's a sign here that warns boaters to go slow. But as you can also see, the shoreline has receded several hundred yards, and this reservoir is at about 7% of its capacity. To many experts, Makanda is a microcosm of a much larger water crisis. Besides climate change and the continuing two-year drought, they blame aging, poorly maintained infrastructure for creating the perfect storm. No one is exempt, not even the upscale sections, home to several elite private schools and Rhodes University. What do people uh, not take for granted anymore that they once did? Flushing toilets, showers, we're allowed a two-minute shower, so generally we're a bit dirtier. <laughs> Jane Tanner, a hydrologist at Rhodes, says such measures can only go so far and that major structural changes to the water supply system are needed. Previously, uh, under apartheid, our, our water supply scheme very much um, targeted the white population and there were people that were not accounted for. But it hasn't been kept up and added to and that's where we're at at the moment. Mzukizi Mpalwa, Makanda's first black mayor, says the city is committed to improving its water infrastructure and merging its segregated systems into one that serves all residents. 
We're currently trying to link the two systems so that you, the water from the east can come to the west and the water from the west can go to the east. As officials scramble to meet the emergency in Makanda, a South African Islamic charity called Gift of the Givers offered its help. Distributing bottled water was a first step. One meter interval. The group also located and drilled boreholes or deep water wells. Gideon Kronewald led the effort. With GPS guidance, a magnetometer, and he says faith in God, Kronewald drilled 15 wells. It's a precision job to find cracks in the bedrock that lead to the aquifer below. It's just more than an inch and you have to hit it. If you hit, if you miss it, you get maybe a thousand liters an hour, which is not going to solve your problem. We want to get at least 10,000 liters an hour to make it viable. Once the water was tested, Kronowald connected it to a filtration system and a community tap. Mayor Impalwa was along as one tap in the Joza neighborhood was inaugurated. <laughs> Makanda will soon replace bottled water with these taps, but groundwater is not a sustainable solution. By the time the, the drought finishes, I think those aquifers are going to be seriously depleted. And she says Makanda may be a proverbial canary in the coal mine. We're a small town. We can, in a way, cope. Translate that to a large city, one of the large African cities, and you really have a nightmare situation. Cape Town barely escaped it, she says, but with growing populations and climate patterns of longer, more frequent droughts, even the continent's most modern city will likely face the renewed threat of a day zero for many years to come. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Fred de Sam Lazaro in Makanda, South Africa. Fred's reporting is a partnership with the Undertold Stories Project at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota.